Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for another edition of IRENA's Insights webinar series. Uh, my name is Deepti Sidanti, and I'm joining from IRENA's Innovation and Technology Center in Bonn, Germany. Um, for those of you joining us for the first time, I want to introduce IRENA and our webinar series. IRENA is an intergovernmental organization with 169 member countries and another 15 countries in their accession process. We support countries in their transition to to a sustainable energy future and serve as the principal platform for uh, international cooperation, a center for excellence and a repository of policy, technology, resource and financial knowledge on renewable energy. Since our analytical work and our engagement with our members generates a lot of valuable insights, we are constantly looking for more ways to share those insights with you. And that is why we've launched this webinar series. We have organized over 50 webinars on several topics, and you can check them all on our IVNAS event website. Our aim is to keep these webinars uh, short and sweet, lasting approximately 30 minutes. While we cannot cover possibly everything in this time frame, we hope to give you enough information and sources to help you explore the topic further. Um, today, in the next 30 minutes, we will hear from Carlos Ruiz. Uh, he will share key insights from our IRENA's recent publications uh, titled Decarbonizing Hard to Abate Sectors with Renewables, Perspectives from the G7. So before we start, a few housekeeping items. The webinar will be recorded and posted on the IRENA website under events. Uh, and if you have any questions, please make use of the Q&A uh, function. So uh, let's welcome Carlos to the IRENA Insights webinar series. Carlos, the floor is yours. Good evening. Um, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Thank you all for attending this webinar. And um, I hope you find it interesting. Uh, so let's get into it. Next slide, please. Today, today's presentation is going to cover our most recent report, which focuses on the decarbonization of hard to abate sectors, and which we prepared at the request of the Italian presidency of the G7 to advise them on how they can accelerate the global energy transition. Um, as you probably know, um, limiting the global temperature rise under 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius will require all the sectors of the economy to decarbonize. And um, while some of these sectors, such as uh, electricity supply, or for example, passenger road vehicles already have a clear path to, to net zero um, through renewables, other sectors are um, somewhat harder to decarbonize due to their inherent characteristics. And so um, this report focuses on five sectors specifically. Um, these are heavy duty road transport, shipping, aviation, iron and steel making, and chemical manufacturing. And as you can see on the charts on the right, these five sectors are responsible for almost uh, a quarter of global total final energy consumption and for about a fifth of uh, all uh, CO2 emissions. So it's quite substantial. Um, the progress in these sectors in terms of decarbonization has been slow uh, till today. However, um, there's a couple of factors that invite us to have a little bit of optimism, which are this, the fact that there's unprecedented social and, and political momentum, and the fact that um, renewables and other enabling technologies have become uh, very mature and um, a lot more competitive. Um, so uh, we think that the decarbonization of the sectors is, is closer to reality than ever before. Next slide, please. Um, and so while each sector is different and uh, each sector will require, will require different approaches, most of the emissions reductions will have to be achieved through a combination of uh, five main pathways. Some of these pathways are of course more relevant to some sectors than others. This chart that you see on the screen has a lot of information. So I, I invite you to have a, a closer look uh, once the webinar is uploaded, but I'll give you a quick uh, run through. Um, the first of these pathways is uh, will consist on reducing demand and, and intensity for energy and materials, as well as improving efficiency. And this pathway can have immediate impact uh, in the sectors in terms of CO2 reductions, and it's, it's relevant for all five sectors that we cover in this report. The second pathway is direct electrification. 
uh, which means replacing technologies and processes that rely on fossil fuels with alternatives that are powered directly with clean electricity. This pathway is expected to be particularly important for heavy duty trucks, which are uh, said to become electric, uh, but also for the steel industry as the share of scrap recycling uh, grows and which is done through electric furnaces. Um, also for the chemical industry, which uh, will um, see the share of electric tractors rise, and perhaps even for shipping where uh, beyond the electric vessels, uh, which could cover short routes, uh, we also need to talk about onshore power and electrifying ships at port, which uh, contributes with, with uh, large emission reductions. The third pathway is um, the direct use of renewable heat and biomass. So we're talking about directly replacing fossil fuels and feedstocks with uh, biofuels, for example. Um, here we're talking uh, about biofuels for, for shipping and aviation. And in the chemical sectors, um, uh, the increasing use of biofeedstocks and, and bioplastics um, then moving on to the fourth pathway is the indirect use of electricity. So um, this means producing uh, green hydrogen and later synthetic fuels based on, on this green hydrogen, uh, such as e-methanol or e-ammonia for shipping, e-kerosene for aviation. We're also talking about the use of green hydrogen for iron reduction in steel making. And um, again, in the chemical sector, we're talking about the use of synthetic uh, feedstocks and chemicals. Um, with that said, as you see, the, the circles in this in this uh, pathway are not completely full, which means that uh, this pathway still requires some time for the technology to mature and, and for the prices to go down. So it's more of a, a medium to long term solution. And lastly, the fifth pathway is the use of carbon capture uh, utilization and removal measures um, in processes where the emissions cannot be fully eliminated. And um, this technology would likely be important for the chemical sector, for the production of synthetic fuels, which have uh, carbon, uh, carbon atoms in the molecules. Um, and of course, it can also be used to eliminate some of the uh, remaining emissions from steel making. And um, it could even become important at a certain point uh, for shipping, uh, depending on how onboard carbon capture um, develops. Um, Next slide, please. So uh, let's have a closer look at uh, each of the sectors, um, mostly at the, at the challenges and, and the infrastructure needs they have, uh, starting with heavy duty trucks. So um, something interesting here is in the, that in the last 13 years, the price of, of battery packs, uh, specifically lithium ion, has declined uh, close to 90%. Uh, while the energy uh, density of the batteries has increased and uh, it's crossed the, the five hour, watt hours per kilogram mark uh, for some manufacturers. So this is um, great progress in, in terms of batteries, which has unlocked the, the electrification of heavy duty trucks. Um, and so um, with that said, um, even though um, battery uh, powered trucks have become sort of the the most likely solution. Uh, we think that biofuels can still play a role, particularly in decarbonizing the existing uh, fleet of cars uh, or trucks that, that will remain in service for decades. Um, in order for this uh, transition to, to materialize uh, in, in heavy duty trucks, there's a number of challenges that need to be overcome, of course, and this include the, the higher up upfront costs of electric trucks, the, the lack of uh, charging infrastructure and just the, the early stage of the supply chain. Um, at the same time, uh, we there are uh, important infrastructure needs. Uh, again, we're talking about fast charging infrastructure, uh, an expansion and reinforcement of the power grid and uh, the, the installation of digital infrastructure and to enable smart charging and, and other technologies. Next slide, please. And contrary to what we saw for trucks, where direct electrification plays a, a large role for shipping and aviation, direct electrification plays a more secondary role. And um, for these two sectors, biofuels and e-fuels are said to play the, the major role in the decarbonization. 
More concretely, we're talking about biojet and um, e-kerosene for aviation. And uh, for shipping, we're talking about biodiesels, bio-LNG, bio-LPG, biomethanol, and e-methanol and e-ammonia. Of course, these uh, options also come with their challenges. First of all, is the need to create the demand for these new fuels and to scale up their, their, their supply at the same time. Um, for biofuels, the challenge is sustainably scaling up uh, the supply chains to, to the level that is needed at the pace that is needed. For e-fuels like e-kerosene or e-methanol, uh, which are molecules that contain carbon, uh, the challenge is the need to, to use sustainable carbon and um, basically obtaining these sustainable carbon sources. Uh, in particular, because direct air capture is a technology that is not yet mature and it's, and it's uh, very expensive. So that leaves us for the moment mostly with biogenic uh, carbon sources. Um, another challenge, uh, which is particular to ammonia uh, in the case of shipping, is uh, just operational and safety considerations. Ammonia is quite toxic, and so uh, special considerations uh, and measures need to be taken. Um, one big challenge for all of these fuels is that they are more expensive than their fossil counterparts. The chart on the left, <clears throat> excuse me, the chart on the left shows the cost comparison for uh, renewable-based fuels for shipping. So in this chart, you can see biofuels in green, um, e-fuels in blue, and then the the purple uh, uh, range there is the the price of the LSFO, and we can see that. Um, in general, uh, sustainable shipping fuels remain more expensive than their fossil alternatives in a range of two to six times higher the price. And um, biofuels can uh, become competitive, um, especially when, when fossil fuel prices are peaking. So uh, with, with the conflicts that we see in the world today and the squeeze on, on fossil fuels, um, the prices go up and then um, biofuels have become uh, competitive and the demand has increased for these fuels. However, for e-fuels, for e-fuels, uh, that's not the case and they, they remain quite expensive. And uh, if you can show the next chart. Um, this is the similar, uh, a similar chart, uh, but for aviation fuels and here uh, we see a similar trend. Uh, with uh, biofuels or biojets in general uh, remaining more expensive, e-fuels also, and um, some uh, biofuels or some uh, biofuel production pathways uh, remain competitive with the higher range of, of fossil fuel costs. So uh, it will it will take some time to um, to get these prices down. And this is uh, this will be addressed later in the recommendations. But um, in terms of infrastructure needs, um, these sectors will require, of course, um, the, the deployment of a lot of infrastructure in order to not delay the transition. Uh, some of the most important uh, being the again the reinforcement of the power infrastructure for the charging facilities of uh, electric vessels and aircraft, and also for for e fuel production. Uh, we're also talking about uh, short to ship power for for uh, for ships, um, and we're talking about uh, the need for storage and bunker equipment for sustainable fuels. Next slide, please. So moving on to industry, uh, first let's talk about steel. Uh, the steel industry still relies heavily on primary steel making. Uh, which relies on fossil fuels to power the furnaces that reduce the iron and, and smelt the steel. Um, direct electrification is, is the pathway uh, that is said to play a key role in decarbonizing this sector, mainly by increasing the share of steel produced to, through the secondary route. So secondary uh, steel production is based on scrap and uh, this route can rely on electric furnaces. And as you can see on the chart on the left, um, the, the availability of scrap is expected to increase by 2050. And as much as half of global steel demand could be satisfied through secondary steel production. Now that leaves us with the remaining half, 
of, of steel production, uh, which relies on the primary route. Um, and that will also have to transition away from fossil fuels. And here uh, we see a role for, for green hydrogen to have, uh, for green hydrogen, sorry, um, through uh, hydrogen-based direct iron reduction, uh, which is a technology that is uh, already close to commercial maturity. Um, again, we, we need to talk about the challenges. Uh, this, this includes the need for large amounts of uh, high-grade iron ore, and the fact that steel plants are not necessarily located where the best renewable sources are. And this means that they might not have access to the cheapest renewable electricity and almost certainly uh, not to the cheapest. The energy needs of the new technologies. Uh, as well as the need for hydrogen transport and infrastructure, and possibly the need for carbon capture and transfer of capacity. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, we talk about chemicals. Um, the chemical sector will be producing many of the of the fuels that we've uh, talked about in the previous slides, uh, and it's important to highlight that the emissions of these sectors of this sector uh, derive from energy that is used in the production process, but also from uh, the energy carriers which are, which are used as feedstock for chemicals and plastics, and, we, and which have emissions later when they are combusted or improperly disposed of. Um, and so both of these emission sources need to be eliminated to, to reach that here in this sector. An important approach here is the increase of energy and material efficiency. Um, by reducing demand, uh, maybe through the use, through the reuse and recycling of, of products, and also through applying uh, circular economy uh, concepts. Other pathways include the substitution of fossil fuels with bio-based feedstocks, um, the electrification of multiple heating processes, and the use of e-crackers, and the use of green hydrogen to to manufacture synthetic fuels, which is something I already mentioned. Um, an example of this is, for example, um, substituting conventional ammonia with, with renewable ammonia, uh, which is made with green hydrogen instead of natural gas. And amongst the, the challenges faced by this sector are the higher costs of renewable fuels and plastics compared to their conventional counterparts. Uh, this, of course, holds back the demand for these products. Uh, and also the, the recurrent uh, point here that uh, there's a need to access uh, cheap renewable electricity, cheap green hydrogen, cheap sustainable carbon, all of which have uh, geographical considerations and their own infrastructure needs. So uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. Despite all the challenges mentioned, these sectors have uh, begun making a good progress to, towards their decarbonization, particularly on, on the technology side. Um, for transport, as we already saw, the progress of battery technologies in the last few years has been really uh, astounding, uh, pretty much setting, settling the case for, for the electrification of trucks rather than the use of hydrogen, and possibly even unlocking electrification opportunities uh, for other sectors like shipping and aviation. Um, we also see that a green fuel industry is starting to emerge uh, for shipping and aviation. Um, larger volumes of biofuels are, are reaching the market, and several e-fuel projects are expected to come online in the next few years. And also, um, uh, another, another important point in terms of progress is that uh, propuls propulsion technologies that rely on these new fuels uh, have become available. There are already several methanol-capable ships on the water, and um, an ammonia engine is expected to become available within a couple of years. And for industry, uh, we see that the pipeline of green steel projects is growing. Um, by 2030, 62 megatons of steel per year from hydrogen-based uh, direct reduced iron could materialize. The number of methanol and ammonia projects is also growing with a projected capacity of uh, almost 20 megatons of methanol per year. Uh, expected to be operational by 2028, and uh, 15 megatons per year of renewable ammonia also within this decade. And um, in the technology side, 
technologies such as e-crackers are already being tested at a pre-commercial scale. So um, the, the landscape is positive. Um, even though we do have to highlight that all of these sectors are not on track to reach net zero as of today. Uh, and so uh, urgent action is needed, which takes me to the next slide uh, on the recommendations that we made uh, to the G7 presidency on, on, on how to accelerate this transition. Um, the first one of these recommendations is establish, establishing sector-specific decarbonization targets. We think that the G7 countries can support the transition by establishing long-term sector-specific objectives um, that also have uh, clear intermediate milestones that uh, can send the right signals to the markets. And uh, beyond national policies, uh, the G7 can also work with other countries towards uh, achieving international convergence uh, in decarbonization objectives. Um, especially for key traded commodities such as steel, ammonia, methanol, and other fuels. The second recommendation is taking uh, further steps towards creating a level playing field for green technologies. We saw the charts on, on, the, on the cost gap for green fuels, and uh, this is a very important point. We think that uh, creating a level playing field can be done by implementing carbon pricing uh, policies, both nationally and internationally. And the idea is basically to internalize the, the negative externalities of fossil energy to really make a, a fair comparison of these fuels. Um, and here we're also talking about reducing the relative taxation of electricity versus that of fossil fuels, which could play an important role in driving the electrification of, of heat uh, and transport applications. The third recommendation is accelerating the deployment of renewable power supply in alignment with uh, COP28 pledge to triple renewable capacity by 2030. Um, this, of course, will require uh, a lot of efforts, including substantially scaling up investments and updating and streamlining policies and regulations that can accelerate the deployment of, of renewable energy projects. The fourth recommendation is scaling up sustainable bioenergy production and sustainable carbon sourcing. Um, here, um, we think that G7 countries can support the transition in part of its sectors by working with other countries to scale up um, the global sustainable biomass supply chains. And uh, this can be achieved with uh, policies that provide incentives for the production and, and and the use of, of bioenergy, but also coupled with strict sustainability governance procedures and regulations. And this point is also very important because biomass is also expected to be used as a source for carbon in synthetic fuels. The fifth recommendation is kickstarting the, the deployment of production capacity for green hydrogen derivatives. Um, we think that the transition can be accelerated by supporting the first wave of commercial scale plants uh, to produce the low carbon commodities that we talked about uh, with green hydrogen. And so uh, the sixth recommendation is enhancing uh, planning practices to accelerate the deployment of critical infrastructure. Um, here, we think that G7 countries can support the transition in, in these sectors by strengthening uh, cross-sectoral planning and, and international coordination as to at least not delay the, the transition anymore. Um, but also an important part here is accelerating the permitting and the deployment of critical energy infrastructure as to not delay the transition. Here we're talking about power grids, bioenergy conversion plants, hydrogen networks, fuel terminals, imports and uh, airports, etc. The seventh recommendation is driving the adoption of innovative technologies to avoid locking. So here we're talking about prioritizing and promoting the deployment of technologies that are uh, really consistent with net zero emissions. The, the use of technologies that are not compatible with net zero will only uh, result in, in a delayed transition. So this is a very important point. And here we think that the G7 can also work with other countries towards the adoption of these solutions, um, particularly in developing nations uh, through technology cooperation programs and through the exchange of best practices. The eighth recommendation is creating um, the initial market for low carbon commodities. And here we're talking about establishing green procurement programs or establishing mandate, mandates for, for low carbon commodities. 
Um, and here it's also important to highlight the need to work with other countries to accelerate the convergence in terms of definitions, standards, thresholds, certification procedures, uh, etc., to really enable the international trade of these commodities. The ninth recommendation is bridging the finance gap. So we believe that uh, the G7 countries can drive an increase in the in the global global flow of investments towards hard to, hard to abate sectors. Um, also working, of course, with the private sector and with financial institutions in, in the risking projects. And this can be done in several ways. Um, for example, through the provision of guarantees, through, through concessional loans, through blended finance, and of course, other instruments. The 10th recommendation is the supporting the development of a skilled workforce. So these new technologies come with uh, new needs for knowledge. And um, there is really a need to develop to develop the skills that are needed to support this transition. And this will require a fluid exchange of information on the latest technologies and the best practices, but also providing support for specialized education programs and trainings. And uh, here, again, we have to talk about collaboration and uh, helping developing and emerging economies to build the right set of skills. Uh, and building capacity for, for their own transitions. And um, this is a good connection to the last recommendation, which is fostering international collaboration. Uh, a transition will only be achieved if everyone works together. And uh, we see that working together, the G7 working together with, with developing countries towards uh, partnerships that are mutually beneficial can really uh, accelerate the decarbonization of supply chains for, for industrial commodities. And uh, this, can be in, this can be done in a few ways. Uh, for, for example, cooperative long-term investment planning. And um, if done properly, this can also result in a lower cost transition for everyone. And the next slide, please. So with this slide, I'll just close the presentation. I hope you found it useful and interesting. And just a, a quick reminder that the report is uh, free and it's available to download on Irina's website. And uh, that's it. Thank you again for being here. And I think I can answer uh, a couple of questions now. Um, thank you, Carlos, for this very insightful presentation. To our audience, uh, we encourage you to take the advantage of the chat feature to ask any questions or doubts you may have. Um, we do have one question already, Carlos, if you want to take it. Thank you, Deepti. Uh, I see a question on uh, whether I see any risk for unsuccessful transformation of any industry, especially uh, the, the steel industry. Is there a plan B for the earth to achieve net zero global warming or climate change? Um, I, I think there, there is, of course, a risk. Um, we're trying to raise awareness to, to minimize this risk and to get everyone uh, moving in the right direction. Um, the, the risks are high, especially for industry. Um, and I think, uh, especially for chemicals, the chemical industry will be critical uh, for the decarbonization of uh, the transport sectors, for example. So, uh, yeah, th there is definitely a risk, but um, hopefully uh, with the increased uh, momentum and the increased uh, levels of action and the growing investments in renewables and transition technologies, we, we will be able to manage. As I said, we are currently not on track and um, uh, we are doing our best to, to change um, this, this landscape. Uh, I think, unfortunately, this will be our time for today. Um, I would, again, like to thank Carlos for his time and for sharing insights on decarbonizing hard to abate sectors with renewables. And, uh, of course, thank you to all of you for joining us today and for, and for your attention and questions. We hope you learned something new and something interesting. So the recording and slides will be posted on the IRENA's website under events. So have a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you.